Hello and welcome to the third video in the mini-series about NIM. I'm Arne, also known as Crook02 on IRC and on GitHub. I will talk about things that I worked recently on and for the 020 release of NIM. So first thing I want to talk about is the most controversial one. It's the shift right, which is now sign preserving by default in NIM. The idea behind this was that uh, the behavior was very surprising for non uh, NIM developers. In every C compiler, the right or every known C compiler that I know about, the right shift operator, even though it's not specified by the C standard, is sign preserving. Basically, what this means is when you do a right shift operation on a negative number, it will stay a negative number. And also, when you do a right shift operation on a negative number, it doesn't matter in what uh, amount of bits you encode it, as long as it fits in these, uh, this number, the right shift operation should uh, give you the same result. So uh, in this example, here on, on binary, when you do right shift, you will see that it introduces new bits. So the sign bit is extended. When you do on negative one, which is in binary just once, and you do a right shift operation on it, it stays negative one in every possible uh, size. Um, this was different in older versions of NIM. In older versions of NIM, it just interpreted the number as an unsigned number, and then did the right shift and introduced uh, zero bytes on the left. So with the same number you just saw, shifted uh, three uh, bits to the right, it would introduce three zeros on the left, which might be what you want, but also might not be what you want. And um, in this version of NIM, on signed numbers, it introduces sign bits, on unsigned numbers, it behaves like the old version. But you can create uh, for backwards compatibility, there is the flag, you can pass uh, its dash D, NIM old shift right, then the uh, right shift operator works like in uh, in the old version, you will get deprecation warnings on every occasion where you use the right shift operator, so you can look where you use it and fix its usage. And uh, here you also see when you apply right shift of one bit to the neg uh, to the value of minus one, the result is different depending on how many bits of precision you have. And this has been changed. So, so much about that. Second thing I want to talk about is uh, a change for a type desk in macro parameters. In NIM, all macro parameters are passed in as NIM nodes. So you get the AST as a NIM node. With one exception, parameters of type type descriptor. And this was, was very annoying uh, for me to use because whenever you pass in a type descriptor to a macro, it's not a NIM node, it's a type descriptor. And you cannot put the type descriptor in the AST that you want to construct in a macro. You want to construct with new tree an AST from the macro, but you cannot put in the type descriptor because it's not a NIM node. And the new tree requires arguments of type NIM node. And this has been changed to NIM node. So the symbol type within the macro body will now be of type NIM node and you will be able to use it uh, to construct the AST. This surprisingly, this change looks like a change that uh, would break a lot of code, but apparently it does not break a lot of code. First of all, because this was a broken concept. Nobody or very little code was written that relies on this behavior. And second of all, all the API that's provided by type descriptor, that's in, uh, in, in macros.nim, 
is also provided when you pass in a NIM node with the symbol inside. So it might happen that you have code that uses type descriptor and it still works like you expect it to work. By the way, this also changes the behavior of type descriptor as the return type, which was also treated like an exception, but now it isn't anymore. So third point I want to talk about is uh, strict arrange checks. In the past, you could write code like this when you wanted to have a 30-bit unsigned integer with every bit set. But we now have strict arrange checks in the NIM compiler and negative one is strictly speaking not in the range of unsigned numbers because it's not an unsigned number. But what you are allowed to do is either you cast uh, the negative one to unsigned 32 and uh, this will still work or you do um, a bit not on the zero to get an uh, unsigned uh, number with all bits set. So fourth point is expand macros parameter. NIM now supports a new flag to expand macros. Here expand macro will expand the macro foo bar. Well, the compiler will expand it anyway, but it will print the expanded macro into the console. For this, I will open another file here. Um, this macro just generates some random code and it prints the result. This is basically how you could do it all the way. And um, the compiler also has uh, the expand macro parameter. And so this is the output from uh, the macro itself. You have the echo and you have uh, the bracket expression, basically the uh, array expression. And in from expand macro, it prints the same AST, but with the macro post processing applied. This means you will also be able to see the inlining of templates. And um, when there are further macros from that macro, you will also see those expanded because this is what you could do before. And the expand macro also works with macros that you do not have control over or where you don't have control to the source code. This way of debugging a macro only works when you can actually modify the macro. So fifth point I want to talk about is our better case of error messages. In the past, when a uh, case of expression was not fully covered, when not every value was covered in the case of expression, you just got an error, not cases are covered. And now the NIM compiler actually tells you which case label is missing. Here, error, not all cases are covered, missing value C. So we can fix this by either adding value C here, or uh, otherwise we can also set an else block here. Uh, so. Okay, code block evaluation complete. This works. So then I want to talk about an RFC where I invested quite some time but i will only talk about it shortly in this video because this video shouldn't be about this rfc the idea is well i didn't invent this type of type inference but i think this type of type inference works very well for nim i think it is used in programming languages such as haskell currently what the nim compiler does is it 
semantically checks this expression, this one literal in isolation. It sees, okay, it's a one, but I don't know in uh, what type of literal it is. And then later it sees, ah, it's assigned to a float. So I have to interpret this one as a float literal. And what I want to change is to pass in the context information of float to the passing of the expression on the right hand side of the uh, assignment. So we will ex, uh, semantically check the right hand side expression with the type information that we know this expression has to evaluate to. For the one literal this won't be a uh, big change but for uh, the second example uh, there will be a better, uh, bigger change. On the left hand side here we expect a tuple with two floating points. On the right hand side we have a tuple expression and since we have the type of the tuple expression we can now recursively divide the expected type and we know the first element of the tuple expression has to be of type float so we can um, pass the one as or um, interpret the one as a floating point uh, literal. Currently what the compiler does is it uh, passes the one as an integer literal on the left and on the right and then we have a tuple of two integer literals and this will not match to the left hand side. This will also work of course for array expressions. When you expect something uh, of type array like we have three elements of type uh, float and when you assign one, two, three, currently the parser tells you, sorry, I have an array of three integers and you want to assign it to uh, a value of t where a value of x of an array of floating point and that doesn't work. With the new algorithm, this can be passed properly. But keep in mind, this will only affect assignments, not overloads. This algorithm is limited in that respect. So, and last but not least, I want to talk about Megatest. Megatest is a test that we introduced in the automated testing environment of the NIM compiler. This will not affect usability of NIM itself. It will only affect people who contribute to NIM. And the idea here is that there are many small micro tests in the testing suit where most of the time is taking to compile actually system.nim and the test itself is just a few lines of code. And what Megatest does is it collects automatically all these tests, it analyzes them and sees if they can all be uh, joined. Then it creates one big binary all, out of all these test files, uh, compiles them into one binary and then executes that. And this is to reduce the overhead that would otherwise be created by compiling system.nim over and over again. So that's it from my side. Thank you for listening and goodbye.